Shout out to G-Man Boxing. Where's the piss bottle? It's over there. All right, people. Review of the week time. A <sighs> lot to talk about from last night. The fallout from last night. Um, I went back and watched that fight again this morning. Just, what, what more can you say about Lee Wood versus Michael Conlon other than that that was definitely candidate for a fight of the year. It's going to take some topping. It's going to take some topping. The drama, the the, start, the way that fight started, it, it was weird. Like I mean, You did kind of watch it and get the feeling that, there was, how do I put it? There was drama left to unfold in this fight, even late on. So even late on in that fight, where Mick Conlon, from my opinion, was taking control and was just showing that he was the superior boxer. Lee Wood was trying. You just felt that there was still a little bit of drama to come at the end. Now, I didn't foresee that knockout happening, but my day is what a knockout as well. And you know, thankfully today, Mick Conlon, he's all right. He was taken to hospital yesterday at uh, night. He was out today. He actually met up with Lee Wood for a picture together. So thankfully thank god because it was a scary knockout i'll talk about that more in a sec both guys are okay and both guys are you know safe and sound in terms of the knockout when i watched it live on the the zone uh, broadcast they obviously didn't show any slow motion replays of it because they didn't know the situation with mick conlon so hence the reason why they didn't show any replays of it but when you watch it live and you're watching it there because of the way the position of the both fighters were it was actually a right hand from lee wood that landed Bang on Mick Conlon's chin. Knocked him out cold. But you couldn't see it because of the angle of both fighters. It was very hard to see it anyway. It did look almost as if Conlon just collapsed. Is, is the best way to describe it. Because you'd see the shots Lee Wood that you could see. That he was throwing. And they weren't landing. But when you go and go on YouTube. You'll find some different camera angles. And some of them are in slow motion replays. You can clearly see Mick Conlon. He's up against the ropes. He lets his glove down. As he's let, letting his glove down. Lee Wood comes with a right hand. You'll see it more from the opposite side, the opposing side, where you're facing the right-hand side of Lee Wood. Lance bang on Mick Conlon's chin. He was out before he hit the ground. And unfortunately fell through the ring. Especially, like, it's not good to fall, to fall out the ring regardless. When you're unconscious, it's even worse because you've no way of really cushioning it. Thankfully, members of Mick Conlon's team saw that that was happening. They were able to cushion the blow, but I believe he did hit his head off the canvas, or the ground, I should say. You know, I've seen a few fighters um, comment saying that there should be maybe some more padding just in case. I know it's rare where it does happen, but there should be maybe some more padding in around ringside just in case it happens again. Because um, it is always scary, like when you see a fighter fall through the ring and hit their head in the ground, because that's a lot harder, especially when they're already, you know, out cold like Mick Conlon was. But um, the fight itself was absolutely spectacular, it really was. I mean, the drama. That was in it from start to finish was just crazy. I mean, you had Mick Conlon dropping Lee Woods so heavily. And Mick Conlon like that is not known as a... Mick Conlon is known as a guy, even when he gets his stoppages, he breaks them down very late. He breaks them down gradually. It's mainly to the body as well, just wearing and tearing his opponents down. He's not someone who's going to take it out with one shot, so we think. But he was able to land on Lee Wood with that brilliant like left hand. He can switch the stances really, really well. And, you know, he was able to land on Lee Wood when Lee Wood was probably a bit too cold. You know, wasn't warmed into the fight. Because later on, he was taking left hands from Conlon. Not as flush, but was still taken nevertheless. And they weren't having any impact on him. But with Lee Wood, after about six rounds, that's when he started coming on a bit. In my opinion, Conlon was still winning. But my days, it was just, it was some fight. It was some fight. Now, let's just talk about the undercard briefly, really, really quickly. Some of the fights on here. Sandy Ryan... I mean, she fought Erica Farris, who was 26 and 5 at the time. I'll put this in context, right? Her last three opponents were Michaela Myers, she fought Jessica McCaskin twice. They were both close fights to McCaskill fights. They're world champions, solid world champions. And you have Sandy Ryan, who is a decent, you know, looking prospect, to be fair, in her own right, but she's training out against a very, very game, very, very live former champion. That was never going to end well. That was never, never, never going to end well. And who was the referee who scored it for Sandy Ryan? Michael Alexander. Ridiculous. Ridiculous scorecard. I mean, and he scored it for Sandy Ryan by quite a wide margin. So, absolutely bizarre scoring there from him. Obviously, Gary Cully. 
fought on the undercard. Gary Cully is a lightweight from Kildare. 13-0, now 14-0. Was able to stop Miguel Vasquez. He's only the third man, I believe, to have stopped Miguel Vasquez. Josh Taylor, and I can't remember who else it was. It was someone else. It wasn't Canelo. Canelo fought him twice and went to a decision both times. So, Vasquez looked very much a jaded fighter in there. Not to take away from Gary Cully and the performance he did. He boxed to a great game plan. He's a very tricky test for most lightweights you don't see six foot two lightweights as big and as gangly as he is and with his good power at long range like gary cully has so he's going to be an issue moving forward for a lot of lightweights to get especially for a short lightweight getting around that reach is going to be a nightmare but as for vasquez it's been a long career and he just didn't look right in there he did not look right in there at all quiven and jaco he fought uh, juan carlos rubio he won every single round Pretty much, I think I, I think I gave Rubio the third round. Um, some people were critical of that performance. I thought he looked all right. I do think he was forcing the right hand a little bit too much. Like he was really, you saw it from the early on. He was looking to set up a right hand, looking to land a big shot, looking to counter, falling short with it, you know. And that was really, if I have one complaint, that was he was too right hand heavy. He was only looking to set that shot up, and he was only looking to make a big statement. He needed to. I said it when I was doing the watch long. I said you need to let the shots flow. Don't go looking for the big shots. If you go looking for the big shots constantly, they're all they're never going to be there. So let the shots, let the boxing just flow. Let it all flow. Let the boxing go. And you'll see the benefits. Now, obviously, he didn't do that. But, look, um, it is what it is. I, I think, though, to be fair, he'll learn a bit from that. And I think he will improve. I don't think he'll be doing that so much in the future. I guess he got used to being able to land it against lesser quality opposition. Obviously, when you're moving forward, you'll be able to get away with that. So, that's Cueven and Jocko. And we move on. The, the one I want to talk about here is Jamel Charlo, Jaime Munguia. Fallen true. Claimed that both fighters uh, agreed terms, but their representatives could not agree over the broadcasting situation. So, Munguia, for those who don't know, Munguia versus Jamal Charlo. All right, not Jamel, Jamal Charlo at 160. Was actually being reported, set to take place on June the 18th, which would have been a great fight. Would have been a very good fight. Charlo Munguia, that just breeds entertainment, I think. Obviously, you're dealing with the Zone and Golden Boy, and you're dealing with PPC, Al Haven, Showtime Fox. Is anyone surprised? When I heard this fight being talked about, I didn't do a video on it. I didn't even touch on it in midweek report because I had a feeling something like this might happen. When you're dealing with rival networks, and Golden Boy and Al Haven have history, you know, was it Al Haven who put, got a lot of Golden Boy fighters? You know, back in what was it, 14, 15, when he started doing, you know, PBC and a load of different networks in America. He was buying up the network time. A lot of fighters were jumping ship and going to Al Heyman at the time. And Al Heyman has worked with other promoters in the past. He has, you know, done business with Eddie Hearn. Done it with Top Rank as well. Actually let Sean Porter go over to Top Rank and fight Terence Crawford there. But to be fair, that was the last fight on Terence Crawford's contract. Um, I'm sure Bob Aaron probably wouldn't have given two you-know-whats at that stage. And, you know, I, I just, it, like, that's such a good fight on paper. It's a competitive fight. It's a good fight. It's a really good fight. And we're not going to see it, not because the fighters don't want it, but because the networks can't agree. And it's just so frustrating. It really, that, that's boxing for you. It just, I love boxing. I love the fights. I love, like, any type of fights but when you see a good fight mentioned like that you're thinking oh really networks as it's not even the fact that it's like the fighters are apparently you know fine with it so it's not like one fighter is being a bit difficult and saying you know i could fight you but no they're both saying yeah let's have it networks kovalev moving up the cruiserweight may 14 travel pulev um kubra pulev is actually going to fight on that card as well that's going to be interesting kubra pulev is getting the bag over there a trailer he really is. He is loving life over there. Castano Charlo, just to reiterate, unification, undisputed, May 14th. Log in your calendar. That's going to be a good fight. I believe that they said it's going to take place in LA. LA or Vegas. I'm pretty sure I said LA. So it's on neutral ground. Obviously, um, Charlo obviously being from Texas and, you know, Castano being a Mexican. But at least it's not. Like, the last time they fought was in Texas. Now, that was obviously because that was the only place they could get fans. So this one... Well, I think I think it's Los Angeles. I'm pretty sure it is. Anyway, so this would be good. I, I think Castano should win. I'm picking him to win this fight. I thought he was very unlucky not to get the decision last time around. 
We're on to the super middleweight division. Now, here we go. Here we go. David Benavides versus Caleb Plant. Reportedly here is now in the works for September of this year. According to, to Oscar, David Benavides' his father, Jose Benavides, Benavides is actually set to fight in May, just coming up in May 21st, against David Lemieux. Now, Lemieux was a golden boy fighter. Unless he's no longer with them, I don't know. But, but he's apparently going to be fighting David Benavides. Now, Benavides is a fighter who I rate very highly. He's had issues with discipline in the past, with being overweight. Obviously, was it 2018? It was 2018. He didn't actually, it wasn't long after he won his title, he got popped um, for, you know, it wasn't for a performance enhancer. He was enjoying himself, having a bit of the old, how you doing? And he got stripped for that. Obviously, he got his title back, but then missed weight badly in 2020. Caleb Plant, he, that'll probably be his first fight after Canelo because there's not talk about him having any fights. Benavides is a fighter, I think, that in order for him to stay disciplined, I think he needs to be consistently fighting pretty, pretty regularly because even when he has done the weight and all that, he's never looked... Now, at the end of the day, like... It's not always the people with, you know, the cut six-pack that you could chop cheese on who win fights. Like, Benavidez isn't, doesn't have any abs. Like, in that regard, he's not the most defined guy. But, boy, he can fight. Him against Lemieux. Lemieux's day is, is well and truly done. He's not looked particularly good at 168, to be honest with you. I mean, he's not really... He was too big for middleweight, but he's not got the dimensions for 168, I don't believe, anyway. I really don't believe. So, Benavidez should... T- and he's never been... The most durable, and I can't see him being any more durable now, especially against Benavidez, who's clinical. Him against Plant, I would make Benavidez firm favourite going into that fight, personally. I would make him extremely favourite. I wouldn't be shocked if we get an announcement. Maybe not on Benavidez versus Plant, but we should get an announcement on his fight this week, because Showtime are set to announce upcoming boxing schedule from Al Heyman. That this is going to be on March the 15th. Tuesday March the 15th. It's going to be at 1pm Eastern Time in America. 6pm UK time. So we'll know the upcoming schedule. For. Um, PBC Showtime Al Heyman. Say what you want to say about Al Heyman. Whenever they do these cards. They announce them quite a way in advance. You know they, they go months in advance. And Al Heyman and PBC. Put, Showtime put on the better cards, I believe. And I think that's why you're seeing more Showtime cards as opposed to Fox cards. I think the, the Showtime cards, for me, they, they've been a lot more consistent with you know having good fights on them. A hell of a lot more consistent with having good fights on them. Now, here's another interesting one I have here. It is about Probellum. We all know Probellum. The, um, the, I think they're kind of part of MTK. And basically, they've announced that they have signed a multi-fight broadcast deal with Eurosport and Discovery. So that means that Sonny Edwards versus Mohamed Wazim, which is going to be shown this coming Saturday. I think that fight's in Dubai or Abu Dhabi. It's in kind of that region of the world. That's going to be shown, I believe, on Eurosport, if you want to correct me on that. But I believe it's going to be shown there. Now, Eurosport, I think it's free. I don't think, well, I think it's, well, actually, it is free because you can get it on terrestrial TV. So it would be Correct me if I'm wrong on that, because I, I just, all I know is if you go in a hotel in the UK, you get Eurosport. I'm pretty sure you do. At least the last hotel I did had Eurosport on it. So if someone wants to double check and correct me on that, I can get Eurosport. I've never had to pay for it. So I, for all I know, it, it, it's terrestrial or something like that. Anyway, they always put on fairly run-of-the-mill sports. Like They'll put on like the under-17s, Football World Cup and stuff like that. But... I wonder what kind of team they're going to have. Are they going to stick with the team that Probellum had when they were on... I think they had a few cards on. Was it Fight TV? Where they had kind of like Ali Drew doing the interviewing. I think they had Barry Jones on commentary as well. Are they going to keep it like that? Or are they going to bring in some of the guys? Because Eurosport have done boxing. They've done a couple of Klitschko fights uh, back towards the back end of his title reign before he fought Brian Jennings. They, a lot of his fights were on Eurosport then. You would Steve Holdworth, who's a very good commentator, very funny guy. He does the commentary there. They had the Queensbury Boxing League, which is basically something that the yard fought in. Queen's Boxing League, I don't know if it's still running. It, it's basically unlicensed. So it's pro. It looks pro. They don't have any headgear on. They have the designer um, trunks, the, the gloves. But it's not official, if you know what I mean. So 
as far as I'm concerned, Probellum, we need to watch them and see how they get on. A lot of fighters are signing with them. they definitely got a lot of uh, people who just turned over from the amateurs, so that's going to be interesting to see. Um, but they have, a, they have a station now. They have a station on TV. They have a platform to work with. So now we have Wasserman and Hennessy on Channel 5, BT Sport and Frank Warren, Sky and Boxer, The Zone and Matchroom. Am I missing anyone? No. So there's a lot of variety in terms of where these fighters can go, what flat platforms they can fight on. So the more we have, the better for the fighters. In terms of fights that were announced, Conor Ben's fight obviously was announced April the 16th. Ah, against Chris Van der Harden. Um, the less said about that, the better. Honestly, the, the less said about that, the better. I don't think it's a good opponent. I've said that before. Ah, oh, man. It's like it's a step back because he's not been relevant for years. Like, years. In terms of other things, I have a statement here from the British Boxing Board of Control that I'm going to read out to you. This is with regard the scorecard specifically of Mr. Ian John Lewis with regards his scoring of Josh Taylor versus Jack Cattrall. They've done an investigation on this on the 10th. Well, this statement was actually released on the 10th of March. I'll read it for you here. The following... Following an intense review of the scoring of Josh Taylor versus Jack Cattrall contest by all three appointed judges, the steward of the British Boxing Board of Control decided to call Mr. Ian John Lewis to appear before them to explain his return scorecard. Having considered Mr. Ian John Lewis' explanation, the steward of the British Boxing uh, sorry, the steward of the board decided to downgrade Mr. John Lewis from A star I'm sorry, yeah, from A star class to an A class official. Was the British Boxing Board were satisfied that Mr. Ian John Lewis's scorecard did not affect the result of the contest? It did. The stewards of the British Board did have issue with his merging. As a regular, oh, I'm after getting rid of that. There it is. As the regulatory body for the sport in Great Britain, the British Boxing Board of Control continued to improve and maintain the high quality and consistency in scoring. Consistency, mm, that's a that's a good one there. Such as the steward, and I'm not just talking. I'm talking in general. How is it that we see so many scorecards? We could have a fight where it's 96, 94, and then the next scorecard it's 100 to 80, or sorry, 90. That's not consistency. As far how can you see it close one way and then not even close the other way? As such, the British Boxing Board of Control have further decided, in addition to each A-star uh, class official being evaluated after each bout, as per current procedure, they will now also be subject to have separate individual annual reviews. I'm surprised they haven't already done that. Finally, the British Boxing Board of Control have contacted all four sanctioned bodies supporting Jack Catchell to be made mandatory challenger for each of the four sanctioned bodies. That's a little bit trickier. I don't know exactly how that's going to work um, because obviously some of them, like, for example, Jose Zapita, I believe, is the WBC mandatory. I don't know. Is he going to have to forfeit that or what's going to happen there? But we will watch this space. Obviously, there's some other subjects we need to talk about. Anthony Joshua, this week, there's been a lot of talk about who his next opponent is going to be. Obviously, Alexander Usek, he looks to be out of action for uh, the foreseeable anyway. The foreseeable anyway. So obviously the next talk is AJ having an interim fight. Joe Joyce's name was mentioned. Deontay Wilder, believe it or not, his name was kind of being thrown around out there. I can't see. Wilder, I think, well, Wilder said that he's going to go and try ayahuasca. And then make a decision what he does. Bizarre. Said that a few weeks ago. Otto Valine and Joe Joyce are the two names. I would imagine that AJ is looking at possibly honest to god possibly luis ortiz maybe ortiz has had a chance to fight aj several times turned down career high payday could have been he could have been in there instead of any ruiz that night in msg would well al Hayden was already stopped ortiz before from getting it but saying that they wanted to get him in there with deontay wilder now he looks old as dirt and he just looks finished so maybe they'll just think ah let's just cash him out let's just cash him out against aj there you go feed him to aj get a couple of mil happy days I would say I prefer Otto Valine because he's, like Ortiz, he's a southpaw, but he's a lot more fresh than Luis Ortiz. I mean, Luis Ortiz, God, God almighty, Jesus Christ. So, Ortiz, or sorry, not Ortiz, Valine versus, or Joe Joyce. Who would you rather? 
Valiant, Joe Joyce. Obviously, from if you're preparing for Usyk, it makes more sense to fight Otto Valiant. So the, it makes way more sense. Similar, not similar style, but Selpa, awkward enough, slash and puncher, a lot taller, has to be said, but you're not really going to get Usyk. You're not going to be able to find someone to mimic Usyk, whereas Joe Joyce, orthodox stance, technically not as good as Alexander Usyk, nowhere near as fast, very strong, hits very hard. It's a different kettle of fish altogether. It's just a completely, completely different kettle of fish altogether. Um, and it's a riskier fight, Joe Joyce. Joe Joyce, Joe Joyce never been beaten. He still has con- he's a lot of confidence. Not that AJ doesn't have confidence, but I'd say there is still doubts there, possibly in his chin. And if he gets hit by Joe Joyce flush, he's going to be in trouble, serious trouble. But we'll watch the space. We don't know if they're going to announce anything for AJ, what they're going to do, if he's going to say, right, well, I can wait, I can hold out, I'm staying in camp, I'm staying ticking over. I kind of was a base in all this before on AJ going with someone completely new and needing time to learn it. Obviously with Angel Fernandez, so it's not as much of a it's it it's a seamless transition. If it was Angel Fernandez and Rob McCracken it was Angel Fernandez, it's not that big a deal in terms of getting used to he already knows him. So maybe he'll just work on things in camp, maybe he'll do intensive sparring. I, I don't know, it could be something like that. In terms of other news, I've seen that pick going around the Billy Joe Saunders. I talked on it already, done a video on it already, touched on it already, but my day is, I've, that other pick of him in the glove store, that looks fairly legit, that, that one to me doesn't look as suspicious as the first one, not to say the first one is suspicious, but some people have said it's real, it's not real, it's been in that fat bubble app, whereas the one where he's in the store, where he does look big, obviously we can't see him in a full length picture, but in that part of it, he looks quite big. I would not be remotely surprised if we don't see him fight this year, and maybe if we don't see him fight again. Wouldn't what I say? It would depend really on Billy Joe, to be honest. Which if he gets any little bit of hunger for boxing, maybe in the next year he might decide to do something, see how it is. But honest to God, if he, if if he is weighing this much now and he's looking this out of shape, boxing is the very very least of his worries. Boxing is at the it's not even on the radar for Billy Joe. Eubank Jr. can call him out, say whatever he wants to say. And as I said, Billy Joe is the kind of person he'd always bite back. But I just can't see Billy Joe having the hunger or desire to go into boxing again. I can't see him do it. He has always been someone who's struggled for discipline anyway. He's always been someone who's wanted to enjoy himself. Like, do you remember when he when he left Mark Tibbs originally, and that was the end of 2016, he went and joined up with Adam Booth. If you may remember, he was training with Adam Boot in London and he had to get out of London and move all the way up to Sheffield, up in the north side of England, because as he said, too much temptation. When he went to Sheffield, he was living in Kid Galahad's attic, basically, and he had no one around, didn't know anyone in the city of Sheffield, knew virtually no one, knew where nowhere was to go. He needed to be away from his friends and family, basically, because as he said by his own admission, it's too much temptation. He's always been someone who has just been easily like he he wants to be a boxer without living the life of a boxer he's someone who loves to fight loves to get in the ring or used to anyway maybe i don't know about now but he loved enjoying himself at the same time and you can't have both you can't enjoy yourself 24 7 and be a successful boxer it doesn't work like that you need to live the life 24 7 of a boxer you can't just go okay i'm gonna go to the gym from six to two you know do all my training all that good stuff and then at the evening i'm gonna go ham it doesn't work like that so with Billy Joe, I would say likelihood is that's the end of Billy Joe's career. If you want, if you if you want, if you are a betting man, it's Cheltenham week. If you ask me, put money on whether Billy Joe will stay or go in terms of boxing. I'd say he's well and truly. He's probably got one foot out the door, and he's probably struggling to fit through the door, which is why the second foot's not gone out. That's pretty much my response to that. That is pretty much the week in a nutshell. I don't think there's much. I touched on most of it in midweek review. That's the great thing about midweek review or midweek report. You get most of the. You, you, you shorten these videos down exponentially and i don't like having like a 30 minute review of the week unless there's absolutely buckets loads to talk about you get longer ones of these when there's like a card in the states there's like a card on friday and a card on saturday and you're talking about all the cards there's only one on last week or what well, yesterday and there's one on well there's two on next weekend so there's the probellum show and obviously there's virgil ortiz versus michael mckinson virgil ortiz is going to beat the crap out of mckinson i can't see mckinson winning that fight and obviously we're into Warrington versus Kiko. 
that's going to be an interesting one. And of course, watch alongs galore. I love doing them watch alongs. That watch along, shout out to everyone who tuned in last night. It's at nearly 10,000 views now, which is crazy. Um, yeah, and we're literally, I think, a subscriber away from 6,800. So come on, we 200 off 7K. And the goal is, if I can do it, I would be so happy. But if we could get to near 8K by kind of summertime in June, might be a bit ambitious. But look, I only hit 6K just after Christmas. And I'm already nearly at 7K. So we can do it. I'd love to be able to say I'm at uh, 7K by the end of this month. Maybe a bit ambitious, but you never know. Warrington... I've got a few things planned for that um, that night because I, that night is going to be good. We're talking watch alongs and aftermaths, all that good stuff. So we'll watch the space. But if you could, if you're new to the channel, if you've never seen me before, if you like it, if you think I make a bit of sense, if you think I'm all right, just leave a like, hit subscribe. For those who are regular viewers, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll leave it there. Hope you have a great week. It's a short week, certainly for us in Ireland. I'm not sure about you guys in the UK. But for us, it's a three-day week. Paddy's day is on Thursday, and we get an extra bank holiday this year on the Friday. So it's a nice one. It's a, it's a three-day week, four-day weekend. So I can get plenty of videos done in the meantime as well. For now, lads and lassies, I'll leave you with that. I hope you enjoyed it. Smash the like button. Have a great day. I'll talk to you. Peace.